Hello guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Inside Arts by Archie. I am Rebecca. To my subscribers, thank you so, so much for being with us and helping us grow this creative community. And if you are new here, I suggest you continue watching as when you get to the end, I will have convinced you to click that subscribe button. Hey guys, I am here at Basha Kuru attending Creative Week. I am going to be talking to creators, those who put money into the creative sector, those who are art enthusiasts, creatives, and so much more. So let's go. challenges such as financial challenges and enable creative um, juices to flow and success basically. So I got an, ex, an insert from um, the South African Cultural Observatory which just basically outlines the, G, the SAGDP when it comes to the, from the CCI. So they were measuring and valuing the South African cultural and creative industries. There is an article about this, I can share the link if you want. But basically, the challenges that are, fun, that are faced by families to achieve this percentage um, has been cited as limited access to funding, also street timelines as a challenge, to just mention a few. And for this part, I just wanted to understand who in the room has received funding. If you can, please just raise your hand. So that's... Only well, that side of the room. Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. Can you keep your hand up, please? So, out of the two, four people that are here, how many of you received funding the first time around? Okay, no one. So there was a difference. People have received funding, but never the first time around. That is because of um, entry level barriers versus experience funding, like you have on this side. So I've tabulated two columns, which the left-hand side is the entry-level barriers, which cite that there's a, there's a barrier with limited tracking record and lack of established reputation. That becomes a barrier. Difficulty in assessing initial funding for... Yeah. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. I am Lega and this is Art Roots. I am here with Snow Kolo, who is the Managing Director at Creative Nestlings. We're just going to ask a few questions about her position there and what is happening here this weekend. Okay, so Sisi, can you please tell us what Creative Nestlings is all about? <laughs> so, Thank you so much. And then what do you think initiatives like this, like the Pasha Uhuru Creative Week, how important is it for the sector? Um, I, would, I would say that they're very important. Um, dialogues like this need to happen because information is key. So uh, what we just shared there and what happened yesterday, I found information that I never have before. So um, it's just a plea that it, it, the attendance is very low. But this is the kind of information that we get. Okay. And then what do you think governments, organizations, corporates, what more could they do so that people can understand the, the role that the creative sector plays? Funding. Funding. Okay. Uh, yeah. Alright, so finding, finding and more finding. <laughs> Alright, thank you Sissy, thank you so much for your time. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, eh? People in the arts think about 
how to create a more kind of healthy environment for mental health in the, in the arts in general. Um, and it's the kind of toolkit that you can use if, can I swear here? If shit goes down, <laughs> it's the kind of toolkit that you can use to try and work through uh, a range of different issues. Now the toolkit is available, at being told, via that QR code. I haven't tested it, I'm not um, And it's, it's a free toolkit and it's super long. And there's many, many different parts to it. So it's the kind of thing that you wouldn't sit down and try and read. Oh, but rather you. you would like go to the context yeah, page you. when you've got a certain situation and kind of address. But I want to talk you through um, what it kind of entails and how it can be used and what some of the things I think we need to be talking about as an industry are. What you'll see is the word visual arts quite often because it's the visual arts network, but I think it applies to creatives in broad. Uh, can we go to the next page? So, um, if I ask you how mental health connects with creative practice, what would you say? I'll give you like a minute to think about that. Like for you, maybe personally, or in general, how do you see a connection between mental health and creative practice? If you're like one of those super quick people and you're ready, just, yeah, super quick one. They're married how? Okay, without your mental health check, you can't relate. That's great, thank you. Other Someone was nodding in the corner, I don't really want to call her out, but I feel like she's got something to say. Okay, I won't call you out. Any other quick one? <laughs> Anybody else? How do you see mental health and creative practice connected? Yes. Um, I think it is a larger conversation now being had to you know, the importance of the Um, before people burn out or you know before people um, take to seek help the yeah. conversation people are more aware upfront of you know the pain into how and how that speaks to their creativity as well. Great, thank you. One more person who wants to kind of give a bit of a response to this question. Disappointing. Oh sorry, I apologize. Yes, I apologize. Mm -hmm. I, um, I think mental health in terms of creativity so bridges how we create uh, to caught up in what's going on in your life and I forget about what it is that you should be creating and how you should be creating. Right. So a lot of the time we tend to try and forget about that or just work on the process. But a lot of the time mental health gets in the way. Super important point. Thank you for that. Thanks for helping me notice that side of the room. Anybody else who wants to add? No, okay. I would like to know how many of you in your community of art artistic peoples, they may not be artists, but you know that they're kind of artistic. How many of you have maybe friends, family members who have struggled with major mental health issues and are artistic or artsy people? That's fewer than I would have thought. Ah, the hands are coming. Okay, we're thinking, yeah. I can tell you from my experience, I find that in the arts, we really struggle with mental health. Like in our industry, we have a higher than average issue with mental health issues. And the statistics seem to say the same. So those people who've done research about this have found that actually there's quite a serious problem with mental health in the arts. So can you move to not the oh, move two slides over? Next one. Perfect. So um, people who've done research, particularly in the UK, um, they found that the likelihood of a mental health problem in the creative sector is three times more than the general, general population. Right? So mental health issues in our industry are three times higher than in like general society. This is UK stats. Um, another survey found 37% of respondents in theatre, film and performance had suffered from depression in the past six months. I'll show you the statistics for the average for depression in South Africa. We, Vanta has started this research, but the, the results haven't come out. So we don't actually know about arts in South Africa. We're using international stats. But if you think that 37% of people in like the performance world struggle with depression, I'll show you what the average is in South Africa. Um, an Australian report found that the levels of moderate to severe anxiety symptoms are 10 times higher 
in the performance theatre environment than in our general population. Right? So what the statistics are showing in parts of the world where actually it's easier to be an artist, because there's more money, there's more support, there's more funding, there's like free medical care, uh, maybe there's even free um, education, etc. There's a problem in our industry. So, you, so my guess would be that the statistics in South Africa would be even worse. Okay. So um, there's a report from Ireland um, where they found that part of the issue is that the way the creative sector operates is not very supportive for our mental health. It doesn't help us be healthy. I would also say that I think that one of the issues is that this kind of um, comes to the point that was being made on the side of the room, is that there's quite a close connection between our emotions, uh, thinking very deeply, feeling very deeply, and being a creative person. Right? Um, for a lot of creatives, we get really deep into issues in ways that other people stay in the safe zone. We sometimes go, let's not say too far, just because of how we are, we go a little further. So if you take the combination of the fact that artists tend to be much more like that, and the fact that our industry doesn't support our own health, you're going to have a serious issue. You know, pointing at yourself and pointing at your own faults. So I think that's the difficult thing about failure because a lot of times it's caused by us, you know, and or sometimes it's caused by us. And I think then it becomes an even more difficult conversation that you have to be real and you have to say, hey, how do I actually come back from this? You know, so yeah, yeah. Matt? Yeah, I mean, I, I share similar sentiments, um, but I'll speak at a more granular level. So. A lot of what I do is iterate in design. So I take a, a problem and I say, okay, let's try this solution. That doesn't quite work, so let's try another thing and the next day we approach it from a slightly different way. So this iterative approach to doing things is, is sort of how I base my design practice. What that means is that you are constantly failing and stuff like that. So it's like working failure into the process as a very like accepted thing. Um, a lot of what I do is, is try to uncover not necessarily new processes or new materials, but just new and interesting ways of, of, of approaching a material or a thing. So like recycling plastic, how do we do that in a Jobo context? It has to be affordable, it has to be understandable. We have to have technology that exists here. We can't, you know, just rely on what's happening in Europe or whatever. So, we're trying to do like a new thing and that requires like failing so much. And, and what we do is we just work that into the process. So we call it failing forward. It's like, okay, cool, we, we stuffed up and we're just gonna sort of like write that all. So it's just about not taking it too personally. And I tell you, like every single day I go through that mindset. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna try this out. I'm prepared for it to not work. And then you've gotta like be able to shift slightly to try something new. Um, so yeah, it's like not putting all eggs in one basket. I think it's something that I've learned a lot. It's like you have your idea and you, you love the idea, but you have to be very willing to let that go without it being like an emotional drain on you. Um, yeah, so that's how I deal with failure pretty much every single day. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Especially around just like not taking it too um, so, I'm, like I said, when I was introducing myself, I failed at two many things that, you know, I didn't clear the way to The three highlights would be the first one was a partner shop, very good place of business, rent on one Problem is, I didn't know how much it cost to have a certain amount of chips, a certain amount of sauces, a certain amount of the amount of right? And if you don't have the numbers that break down how much you actually need for one single unit, the business is probably just running on the ice. You just like, it's just fuck. I'm not what I have but it's fuck. <laughs> but then you realize, wait, now we're actually not making money. Like, like, I think I had a really good partner who was way more consistent than I was. But when I felt like, oh no, this is not working, I panicked and I was the first one. And the takeaway there was just like, not running away from failure. It just means that how I feel. So I don't want to see me fail. So I'm going to step away from this thing and just like, hide myself. Second one was 
that's when the post would hit the shit that was like uh, from the shipments to share as well, right? Very basic thing as well, both our websites, uh, and then shipments for download as well as a share to each other. This was so long ago that like, no one else was actually doing it. So it was actually interesting. And then at the end, a bunch of celebrities and tried to know what shit was. Went from like 200 people looking at the website to like 50,000 super interesting. Ah oh, man, interviews, everyone wants to talk to the kid that's done this. And then, oh shit, I don't know how to make money. Everyone's downloading class papers, it's fun for them. I'm getting attention, it's fun for me. But there was actually no money being made in any of the I was just again, <laughs> running off fights. But the thing is that I learned there was like, you can create value for the world if you actually believe that you have a different view about how things are work, right? So, you can build something that other people actually care about, and that can be powerful. But finding the business it is the hard part. Most recently, I felt that we're building a podcast network. So again, you just kind of just go, oh man, I have a really amazing idea for the world, and the world needs to see this. I am so special. I've made this amazing thing that everyone should care about. It. But no one cares. And then you go, wait, I thought this was the best idea. But it wasn't. There was no market for it, there's no people that genuinely care about being able to do this long term. It's not sustainable as a business. So you see the trend is like really building things that people don't need and not being able to actually factor in the business of anything that you need. So I can build really cool things and people can fall in love with it, but it's hard for them. So it's hard, hard for me to figure out the business side of it. And working at a startup and working at my group for the past seven years, I started to change my mindset to just being you just fail all the time and it's okay. So the thing that I always wish that more people had was one, time to actually figure it out, space and room to actually fail, and being able to have that experience not be a death sentence. I can even fail multiple times. Nothing actually happens. You're not performing once. That's the thing that I always think about. Is that there's no lives in this game. If I just do this thing that is powerful and matters to someone else, that's a, that's a success at some point. And if I learn and I take that failure into something else, even better. Can I just add on to that? Um, I'm so glad that you spoke about building because I think building already is like something that we need to really high five itself. Already having an idea and wanting to execute that idea and feeling like people will buy into this idea is something that should be already be, should be celebrated by itself. You know, um, I think the most difficult thing, especially for black creators, entrepreneurs, is when we build. And then when people don't really feed into that idea, we take it as a punch. When it shouldn't necessarily be that hard because you started already. So I think we should also as creators, as entrepreneurs, really celebrate the fact that you started and you are building something. And that should be celebrated on its own. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So all of you are entrepreneurs or founders, pioneers. How often would you say you experience failure? Is it monthly? Is it yearly? Is it when you have a new idea, a new business venture? How often are you confronting with failure? I think very often. Um, maybe, like I think Matt said it when he was speaking, I think maybe every single day, you know, um, because it depends also how you look at failure. So I could have, a, I could have an idea and I want to build something, but you know, he doesn't really feel that idea. And if you look at if you look at everything as singular, then you're gonna say him not really liking that idea is failure. Do you know what I'm saying? So not everybody's going to buy into your idea, not everybody is going to, you know, purchase or give you money because of your idea. So I think failure is something that you look at every single day, but I think the most important thing is you don't don't focus on that failure, especially if 98% of it is good and that 2% is, when you dwell on that failure is when I think you start to drive yourself insane because I think failure can be met and is met almost every single day as a creator, as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think as I said earlier, it's like mostly a daily thing for me, but I mean, some days are fantastic and your intuition is on and you are nailing everything you do and you know, come away the day of work and you know, you've you know, you done really well, some days are a lot harder. Um, I think what happens though is and it's really important to realize is like not to get into ruts, um, not to get into these like 
mindsets of and it can be really difficult when things aren't working in like a compounding way, you know, like you've been going at this problem for two months now and it's it nothing's sticking, you know. So when you get into those spaces, like yeah, what do I do now? How do I start to deal with this from my mentality point of view? But um, I mean today I got a call from, from Nando's and I, I supply lighting for, for them and uh, I sent oh, must have been like six months ago I sent lights off to Texas, America. I ship ceramic lights, which are you know made out of clay, which is it's a, it's a very silly thing to do. You know? I'm taking a fragile thing and I'm sending it overseas, and so many people are shaking this thing and you know throwing it on on the ship or whatever. And I know that when I when I put all that work into that object, and I, you know I, I pack it up as best as I can. I put as much you know sort of safety precautions in the packaging, and I. I I give it to someone to take. I know that there are so many potential instances where those lights can break. So I get a call today, six months after I delivered the lights to the to the sort of the shipping company. Uh, one of your lights broke. And it's in Texas. What do we do? I'm like, this is this is hard. I haven't been thinking about that light for six months, you know. And now that like failure is coming back to me, and I have to deal with it today. And so it's like, it's quite an interesting thing. And I think two years ago, I would have been like quite affected by this. And it would have like really, you know, grated me. Um, but today I was just like, ah, cool. What am I going to do? I'm going to go into the studio. I'm going to try and make a new one and we'll sort this out with you. And you realize like one thing that I've sort of dealt with is normally I think when I got that call, I would have one maybe try to avoid it. Because I know they don't call me when it's good news. They call me when it's bad news. So it's like maybe I would have like got really anxious about taking that call. Um, and then the second thing would have been like I think I would have been in a bad mood on the call. And then that translates to how that person is now dealing with this problem as well. Instead, I was like, yeah, cool. Let's see what we can do. You know, chipper, happy. And I think that's like something that through like this constant. You know, having to deal with the stuff all the time, and I'm literally on a daily basis. You, you like develop quite thick skin and experience in, in being able to like problem solve around that. So, yeah, I think I mean it's a hugely important thing to be able to like take that and then harness it in a, in a positive way. You know, so I think like again, like that experience of working in a startup, they start teaching you a lot from lots of people around the one of them is just like testing that. Right? So every day you just test as much as you can. Learn as much as you can. Because then it means that something's not working. Right? You can change it very quickly. Right? So I think with how often I feel, I'd say every day, which I enjoy. Right? So like uh, another part of it, a lot of the work that I do is content. Putting out content, all social media, I'm like a rabbit on that. Like, so every day, just trying to put out a video, uh, podcast, uh, Tweets, all these different mediums, styles, and stuff like that. I think initially, I'd say three years ago, it really affected me. So I was like, I care about this from a work perspective. I want people to see my stuff. So I'm going to put out stuff that I believe that I believe people will actually like. Right? So if I put something out and it didn't get a like in five minutes, I take it. It's trash. It's fine. And then I started realizing how much that was actually affecting me because now I'm like. I can't move, I can't do it because every attempt feels like I'm judging myself. If no one validates it, then I'm completely fair. Then, again, going back to this test and learn thing, I started thinking, you know, this doesn't serve it. The, the real, you know, joy or power comes in actually attempting things. And if you fail, learning as much as you can so you can attack this. So, the content again is you put in as much in there and you hope that you understand it. But I'm not doing it for the validation anymore. I'm doing it to make sure that I'm doing it. I'm fulfilling the thing that I can. So if I can get someone to just like look at some information that really matters and helps them change the way they run their business, change the way that they work on the startup, change the way that they creatively help things, then that's what matters. And like that one person that says, hey man, I saw this thing was really cool, it's good for me. And this gave me the energy to try it. I'm like, cool. But if I get no feedback and it's just like out there in the list, it's also okay. So this test and learn mentality is more 
go around just like iterating as quickly as, as possible and learning as much as possible with each thing that you've done. And if people enjoy it, they enjoy it. If they don't, they do it. Um, basically, like, where you need to like, put it in the middle of the place. And he talks about, like, um, you are responsible for the output. The thing that you put to the world, that's your responsibility. Making it as good, as clean, as, as pretty, as beautiful, as impactful as possible. That's your job. But the thing that goes on on the other side of the world, that I flip that around, yes. What comes so you are responsible for the inputs, but the output or whatever comes out of that, and people will you know, respond, share, like, whatever. That's, that's something else. It's about nothing to do. You can control absolutely nothing about it. All you can do is do the work from a good place. And when it doesn't work out, you don't judge yourself. Thank you.